formula. I'm not expecting you to memorize that. Although, after you do a few problems, you'll probably have it memorized. S is the distance above the ground at time t. So, a lot of times, instead of S here, they'll have F of t because the distance is a function of the time. T is the time, usually in seconds, but it could be something else. V sub naught, and that's the way we read that. We read that V sub naught, and V sub naught is the initial velocity. And S sub naught is the initial height. So in other words, if I were going to throw a ball into the air from ground level, S sub naught would be zero. But if I were going to throw this off the top of a building, S sub naught would be 20 feet or however tall the building was. So then, if, that, if we've got our general formula kind of under our belt, we can write an equation for problem 33. It says it's launched straight up from ground level with an initial velocity of 256 feet per second. Okay, so what's that formula going to look like if it's launched from ground level with an initial velocity of 256? Negative 16t squared plus 256t plus 0, which I won't write in. Got it? So that's the equation that we're going to use to, solve, to answer all the questions. A, when will the projectile's height above the ground be 768? Okay, so this is our equation. It has how many variables in it? Two. There's two variables in this equation, right? What does this variable stand for? The distance above the ground. The height above the ground, right? What does this one stand for? Time. So read the question. When will it be this high above the ground? So you're going to plug that number in somewhere, right? Where are you going to plug it in? Uh, That's going to go in for S because what is the seven? Is it 768? What is the 768? It's the height above the ground. So 768 is going in here. And that equation we're going to solve for. Now notice, what's the only variable you have left? T. What's that stand for? Time. time. What does the question ask for? Time. When, right? That's time. That's time. So how do we solve an equation like this? We get it set equal to zero. zero. Quadratic <coughs> equations get set equal to zero. So I'm just going to move everything over here. Add this, subtract this, there's my equation. Now, get your calculators out. I know that's divisible by 16. Is 768 divisible by 16? Yeah, it's 48. 40 what? Now, did I have to do that? Absolutely not, but doesn't it make it nicer? Now, that's a quadratic equation. How are you going to solve it? Well, that one factors, but if you didn't want to factor it or didn't see how to factor it, you could always complete the square or use the quadratic formula, but it does factor quite handily. Now, I want somebody to explain this to me. I got two answers, didn't I? I want you to go back to the problem. I want you to visualize what's actually happening in the problem and tell me why I got two answers. That makes perfect sense. Well, it's a squared equation, so I know quadratic equations give me two answers. But in a physical sense, I mean, in the, in the, in the reality of the problem, why does it make sense, Emma? Exactly. You threw this thing up, boys and girls. You threw it up into the air and you want to know when its height is 768, and aren't there two times, once on the way up and once on the way down? Does that make sense <coughs> to everybody? Yes. Okay. <coughs> when will the projectile's height above ground be less than or equal to, oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm doing B. 
When will the projectile's height above ground be at least 768? When will it be at least 768? Here, isn't this where it's at least 768? So what would I say the answer to that one is? Between 4 and 12, or between 4 and 12 that way? What if it said more than 768? It doesn't. It says at least 768. But what if it said more than? What would change if it said more than 768? These would be open, right? And those would be open intervals. OK. Likewise, then, the next question is, when is it less than 768? Well, that would be everything <coughs> from 0 to 4, and then everything from 12 to, uh-oh, now wait a minute. What do I need to figure out? I need to figure out where, when it ends, right? Can I do that, or do I have to do a bunch of work? Lane? Bingo, this is 16. Now, Lane is exactly right. Kids, what kind of an equation is this? We already said it's quadratic. What do quadratics graph as? Parabolas. What property do all parabolas have? Symmetry, right? That means what happens to the left of the vertex is exactly what happens to the right. So he hit it right on. He said, hey, if it took it four seconds to get this far, it's going to take it four seconds to get that far. Right? OK, that wasn't so hard, was it? OK, good. Let me see. There was one more I wanted to look at. And I wanted to do it on my graphing thing, but someone messed with it. And I, I don't, I'm so untechno, I can't figure it out. So I do it without. Uh, problem number 30. I think it was 30. Is it 30? Did I sign 30? Yeah. yeah. We'll look at 30. Now, you all have your calculators. I have my calculator. I'm just not going to be able to display it. So you're going to uh, have to come, come along with me and stay with me. I am going to, on my calculator, graph, and I would like you to do the same thing. Our, our inequality is this. <coughs> Bless you. My goodness down there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this a little bit. I'm going to say 2x cubed plus 8x minus 4 is greater than or equal to 0. Take a moment to digest that, please. Make sure that looks okay to you. If not, lean over and have your neighbor explain it to you. Okay, now I'm going to pretend this is an equation. So I am going to graph this on my calculator. I'm going to graph this thing on my calculator. And I would like you to do the same thing. Let's get a picture of it here. We remember how to graph. If you forgot, lean over and have your neighbor show you. If you don't have a calculator, lean over and look at your neighbor's calculator. some kind of shape that looks like this. I don't know, yours might look a little bit different, but it looks something like that. Is that what you got? What you got? No. Okay, now, that's a great picture. But this is what I'm supposed <laughs> to be figuring out. I want to know where that curve, this equation right here, is bigger than zero or equal to zero. Now, where in the picture does it actually equal zero? Right here, right? Can I find that point? Yes. So let's second calc, zero, set our bounds. You know how to do this, went through it the other day. I got 0 .47 if I round off.
anybody match that just so I know I'm on the right page here? Point two. Okay. Now, if this had been an equals problem, if this had said where does it equal zero, you would say 0.47. But it says where is it greater than or equal to zero. So that's easy. You just look at the picture. And which part of it do you look at? The part of it here or the part of it here? This part. This is where it's greater than zero, right? So what's the answer to the question? All of the x's bigger than or equal to 0.47. That's all there is to it. Now, if by chance you had graphed your cube, and sometimes they look like this. Cubes look like that. That's a general shape of a cube. It looks like that. There would be three places where it equaled zero, right? And you would have to find each one individually. Then where in the picture, that picture, is it greater than zero? This little bump right here, and then this guy right here. So I'm just gonna make up numbers. Let's say this is negative one, one, and three. I'm making that up. So what would the answer be then? If we wanted to be greater than zero, it would be everything in between negative one and one, good, or greater than or equal to three. Could we do the same thing in a less than problem? Yes, only you would look at the part below. So this is not a big deal, this is easy. You do everything you already know how to do, except instead of just looking at the x-intercepts, you look at the part that's either above or below, depending on if it's greater than or less than. Okay, so that, that's not too bad. So uh, those are the two I wanted to look at. All right, what did you want to look at? I always get to do mine first. What did you want to look at? Maybe uh, number five. Five. Now, we were talking about this yesterday. That when it comes to absolute value inequalities, they can be solved in more than one way, like really every inequality can, or every equation can be. So let's just back up a moment. And I am not telling you how to look problem, but I am asking you, we just had PLC this morning. Sister Mary Sue came. PLC is professional learning communities. That's when like all pre-cal teachers get together and we talk about what we're doing in pre-cal, make sure we're all doing the same thing, sharing ideas, what worked, what didn't work, and so on. Okay. So I asked Sister Mary Sue to come because she teaches calculus. And she starts her year with this kind of review quiz exercise thing. And I know you, most of you aren't going to be taking, well, none of you are going to be taking calculus next year with Sister Mary Sue, but many of you are going to be taking a calculus time. So, Sister, what were we weak? What, what review things did they not know? Well, this kind of thinking is important to a calculus student. I'm not telling you this is how you have to solve these problems, but it's how I will solve them because that's how I want you to think. There are other ways that you can solve this problem. But I want you to think of an absolute value inequality as a distance on the number line. This literally says the distance between some number and four is less than three. Okay, the distance is three. So the farthest out this could be is seven and the farthest back it could be is one. Those are open dots. Now I'm either going to consider everything between one and seven or everything beyond one and seven. This says the distance is less than three, so these are the numbers I'm talking about, right? That is so easy. You just think for a second. Now this problem looks way more complicated than that one, but we can do it the same way. You might guess the first thing you're going to do is add two. Right? Now, here comes the tricky part. Why don't you think about something for a minute? What's the difference between these two things? Wait a minute. Nothing. They're the same thing, right? So if you're like me, this you don't like. This looks backwards to me. So I'm going to turn it around. Is that legal? Absolutely, because I'm inside absolute value. 
Now, if there weren't absolute values there, I can't just be turning my subtractions around. But aren't these exactly the same thing? So are these. Now, I, this is ready to go. This looks like all the examples I've done except for this, right? Yeah. Guess what I'm going to do with that? Divide. I'm going to divide it out of there. Heck yeah, just get rid of it. Somebody said yesterday, Miss Ford, is that legal? Miss mm, Ford doesn't do illegal things. Yes, divide by three. Now, draw your number line. What does this problem say? What's the distance? It says the distance between something and four thirds is less than two. So here's four thirds. If the distance has to be less than two, and you may want to think of that two as six thirds, you might not want to reduce it, you might want to just leave it as six thirds. If the distance is six thirds, what's the farthest out you could be? Ten thirds? And what's the farthest back this way you could be? Negative two thirds. They're open dots again. <coughs> you gotta decide, do you want the numbers in between the dots or do you want the numbers beyond the dots? Less than. Right here, right? So your answer is everything between negative two thirds and 10 thirds. All right, who else had a question about homework problem? Delaney? Actually, well, like when there's a, on number one, it's like x plus four inside the value. Do you put negative four? Yeah, it one? has to be a difference. So x plus four would have to be thought of as x minus negative four. So yes, on your number one, you'll put a negative. Yeah. It's sort of like, mm, this probably isn't the best way to think about this, but it's kind of like, Remember how we, when we had equations of circles, and the center would be at the opposite of this and the opposite of this? It's the same thing. You put the dot at the opposite at the zero value. Yeah. Um, 15. Which one? 15. 15. X cubed minus X is greater than or equal to zero. Now, I do not need a calculator for this one. I'm not sure what the directions are. I should probably read the directions. I don't need a calculator for that one. Yeah, it says use algebra. So what do I do? Yep, you're going to factor it. And the first step in the factoring is to take out an X. But you're not done. This should make your heart flutter. What's that? And how does that factor? So what's our next step? Whenever we do a polynomial inequality, once we get it factored, what's our next step? Yeah, put them on the number line. So what are the zeros? There's three of them this time. One of them is zero. Negative one, zero, and one. Okay, so I have to make sure they're in order. Then what do I do? Find a number. Pick any number I want as long as it's not a dot. So what number do you want? Two. So I'm going to put two in here, and what do I need to have happen? Greater than zero. Greater than zero, which is positive. I'm looking for a positive result. So if I put two in, that would be positive. This would be positive, and this would be positive. What happens when I multiply positive, positive, positive? Oh, I get what I want. So this is part of the answer. Now, this will alternate, but you can check each region. So if you, if you just, okay, you pick two, okay, we figured out that worked. So now I could pick one half, it won't work. I could pick negative one half, it will, and negative two won't. I just know that because I've done them, I want to save time, I don't want to go through and do all those. But that's what you would do. That one won't work, this one will. So the answer to the question is all of the numbers in between negative 1 and 0 or bigger than or equal to 1. And it makes sense that they're going to alternate because if you put in a number bigger than 1, they're all positive. If you put a number in here, one of these parentheses is going to be negative. 
here two of them will be negative, here three of them will be negative. So it makes sense. Okay, got that? All right. Anybody else on that homework assignment? Any other issues? Neilman? Uh, 27. 27, we minus. Okay, this is another uh, calculator one. So it's just like number 30. So you're going to put this in on your calculator. Matt, do you know how to do that? Yeah, I didn't know this calculator wrong. Okay, so you're going to graph y equals 3x cubed minus 12x plus 2 on your calculator. So that's what we're going to do first. So are you doing this along with me, Matt? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now I'm getting a shape kind of like I told you happens sometimes. I'm getting a shape that looks like this. Matt, did you get a shape that looks like this? Yeah, I did. Okay. So these would be the zeros. So I'm going to go through, and you know how to find those points, right? Second count, zero. Okay, so I find all those. Once I find all those values and go back to your problem, you want this to be greater than zero. Well, where does that happen in terms of the picture? It happens when I'm above the x-axis, right? So it happened here and here. So whatever you get for these dots, you're going to say, OK, the answers are between here and here and greater than this one. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Anything else from um, last night's homework? Oh, 
Okay. I want the quiz to be worth. So there are 16 points actually on the quiz, but it's scaled to 26. So just so you understand the math, let's say you miss two. Then how would I find your percentage, your actual percentage? How would I figure that out? 14 divided by 16, right? That would be your percentage. Then I multiply that times 26. That's how you got your score. Then I add two. Okay? So when you look down there and you say, oh, I only missed one and a half, that's one and a half out of 16 that you missed. And then it scaled to 26. Got it? Okay. So we need to go through this. Yours isn't graded. You don't take enough time, it'll get graded. It'll get graded eventually. It's not now. We need to, we need to go through this problem by problem by problem so that we can not make these mistakes over again. So I'm going to give you, I have no idea. We have a weird schedule today. Anybody remember how many minutes shorter it is? Five minutes shorter? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to give you three or four minutes right now to talk about what you missed at your table. So I want everybody talking about what you missed at your table. This one was just and stupid then because we're going to come out and we're going to talk together what you can't figure out as a group. Stupid we can't have this stuff missed on test day. That was stupid. And that one I just put 